Well, this is a rehearsal run that I have of a presentation I'm giving tomorrow. I thought I would uh, record it so I can publish it. And also, you know, I have an experiment that if I'm thinking that I'm going to publish something, maybe I'll look more forward to rehearsing it and do it more. So if some of this sounds oddly stilted or something, it's because I'm pretending that I'm speaking to an audience instead of you, the, the magic mind of the radio listener. Anyhow. So hello. This talk is a uh, kind of an overview of a bunch of pointers when you're starting to think about how to do cloud coding. I call it the, this odd thing of cloud coding with a lengthy subtitle under there because over the years I've been studying cloud computing and figuring out exactly what it is and what it means to different people, to vendors and users, uh, you know, buyers of it, all sorts of things like that. And cloud, like all great things in computers, means different things to different people. And I want to go over what I think it means for people who do software development, whether you're the actual programmers or QA people or operators, anyone involved in the kind of the, the life cycle of the software or the businesses doing it. And we'll just only talk a little bit about business stuff with a technical crowd like this one that usually uh, glazes over their eyes. But I think it's an important thing to go over to understand context. So what you'll get to at the end of this is, is how you can start thinking about uh, an IT strategy to become what, a phrase I like to borrow from the, the ops code people, or chef, I mean software-defined business. Now, I always like to begin my talk with conclusions. And what that means to me is uh, essentially you can leave the presentation whenever you want. And it also reminds me of what it is I've, I'm supposed to be talking about. It kind of provides some framing as you're listening to the things so you can see what we'll get to. So let me go over those briefly. So the first thing that I want to go over is a little bit of business context. And this will help you figure out when you know you need to change. So many of the organizations I talk to are actually large existent organizations that have lots of legacy code and business. They make millions, if not billions of dollars. So they've got a lot going on. And it's actually risky for organizations like that to just sort of haphazardly change without a good reason. I mean, it's fun to change things around in your hobby time and do things like that, but it's good to figure out when you should be changing your IT, uh, the way you do IT in your organization. And I think it's nice to orient around that instead of feeling like you must do it. And it's also good to have some comfort of when you can, you know, pacing and things like that. So we'll look a little bit at the business context of why you might think you should be changing. And it'll help develop one of the uh, a theory that I have now is that unless the business is freaking out, unless they want change, it's probably not a good idea to go through change if you're fearing it and if it's painful. There are some uh, reasons it's not, but I think that's a good uh, extreme rule of thumb. So after we look at what's going on in, in the rest of the world, you know, we in IT are basically servants to uh, the businesses that we're operating. We don't really just do IT for IT's sake. There's always a purpose it's serving. We're going to look at what cloud is for developers. And, and like I was saying in the introduction, I think a lot about what it means for various people. And essentially what it means are, are changing and bringing about new ways and changing the way that you do your product design and management the way you design and develop your code, and then how the code is run and managed in production. Now, this may seem sort of like all of software development, which is basically, uh, I guess, the totality of it. But it's important to think about, as we'll get into, cloud is more than just optimizing the way you're currently doing things. So it's not necessarily a way of doing something better, uh, that, you know, something doing the same things that you're doing better, but it's a new way of doing things that ends up with better results, hence the kind of like wide-reaching changes that it affects. And after looking at that, I, I want to look at some next steps of what can you actually do to, to jump onto this, right? To start doing things in a different way. And there's, there's three key things. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are important. But the first thing is to make sure that you're doing continuous delivery, that you have continuous integration, and you're taking a pipeline mentality to getting your code into production. This is key to do, have being successful in cloud if you're a developer for the most part. And it is something that's been going on for a long time. But as we'll see in some, uh, some survey data, it's not actually adopted that widely. So this is, this is if you want something that you're not currently doing, it's a very easy thing to start doing to just get improvement, regardless of cloud or whatever you're using, but you're going to need it when you get to cloud. And after that, as I was indicating, the way that you uh, design and code um, for, for cloud, the applications you're running on cloud platforms are much different uh, just because of the nature of the technology and, and, and the way that they work. So you have to learn what cloud native architectures are, what 12-factor 12, 12 applications are, and also what the operational needs, the 12-factor um, operations, I guess, uh, of cloud are. And these are new things that you're going to need to know, not only in development, but also in operations. And it's, it's pretty well documented with some good examples, but it's a good topic area, a pointer, as all these things are for you to start looking at. And finally, uh, 
as you start to do um, uh, cloud applications, one of the things you'll you'll start to realize is that operations is a huge part of what cloud cloud applications do and what makes them successful. And you're going to find a lot of different things that you you will need uh, so services not only in development and for your middleware and services that you're using, but also in production that you'll need. And you're you're going to end up needing a cloud platform now. It's, uh, it's certainly possible to build your own platform, right? It's kind of like you can build your own operating system or file system. And there are also alternatives off the shelf, if you will, off the web that you can use as a cloud platform as well. So these are three areas that we'll get into at the end that become helpful when you understand what cloud development is and, and why cloud development is, is becoming uh, something that people are interested in. What's happening out there in the world that, that are causing businesses to benefit from thinking in a cloud way. So first of all, uh, let me give an introduction to myself. So this is me, uh, if you can't tell. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Cote. I go by my last name, Cote. And, and you can find my contact information there. You know, I'm just Cote, C-O-T-E on Twitter. And I have a website that lists all the podcasts and other things that I do where there's my email. But I currently work, uh, hopefully, a long time instead of just uh, currently at, at Pivotal in marketing for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, a cloud platform that supports a lot of the things we're talking about. Now, previous to this, I was an industry analyst at two firms for, uh, I don't know, a total of about just under 10 years. I worked at 451 Research most recently, heading up the, the two practices, or one of the practices associated with software development and another practice associated with infrastructure software, so covering cloud and DevOps and ALM and also cloud management and things like that. And I also worked at Corporate Strategy and M&A at Dell for a couple of years, helping start up the software group and then helping run cloud strategy. So that gave me a great view into what vendors are doing and want to be doing and also what their customers are doing in cloud. So I studied quite a bit there. And then I was a software developer for about 10 years at the application layer, um, working on application code, not so much uh, systems things. So uh, this presentation is, is available online. You saw the, uh, the URL for it earlier. And if you have any questions or you want to talk about this further, feel free to, feel free to contact me. So as promised, if you'll pardon uh, a little interlude into the business land, I think it's important to understand the why that, that we're motivated by doing cloud. So as we'll get into when you're thinking about doing cloud, there's a lot of changes involved. And it's not just as easy as showing up to work and doing the same things over and over again. There's, there's, you'll hear lots of words like journey and transformation. So there's hard work to be done, but the benefits are actually quite good. And let's start way at the top, uh, if you will, of what the business driver is. And I'll try to keep it as brief as possible so we can get to the technical things. So if we look at the current framing of how IT is existing in the world, there's this sort of, at least in the enterprise space, this kind of battle going on. Uh, and that is between the Silicon Valley mindset and the mindset of traditional IT that's a bit, uh, that was built over the last 10 or 15 years. And the Silicon Valley mindset, the, you know, being a software company, is very much so based on crazy notions like failing fast and product development and really working to use software and studying and honing to see how it solves business problems. So an example of, of a Silicon Valley mindset is some, someone like an Uber or an Airbnb. Now these are often categorized as technology companies, but if you think about it, their core business has nothing to do with technology or high technology as we know it nowadays. You know, car services, hotels, and numerous other things. And these companies are trying to become software-defined businesses. That is, companies that rely heavily on custom-written software to run their business. And as this has been progressing over the past 10 or so years, right? If you remember in the mid-2000s, we had e-commerce and things like that. There wasn't a whole lot going on. And then consumer tech took over as the iPhone was launched and we had Facebook and Google continuing. And consumer technology and, and Netflix like that became a very strong source of innovation and, and technology. A lot was going on there. But now all of those changes that have been happening in the last 10 years are creeping into the enterprise space. And you can see in this quote from Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, that the enterprise, the non-consumer oriented uh, businesses are starting to be aware of this. And I like this quote for, for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's very representative of what I see when I talk with enterprises almost weekly or all the time. And what we've been seeing broadly is that enterprises are waking up to the notion that they need to pay a lot closer attention to how these Silicon Valley mindsetted companies are using software, getting software out on a weekly, if not daily basis, 
honing the way the software is, is used and really perfecting, usually it's mobile apps, but just the overall process of software, right? It's not something that just comes out every 12 to 18 months and sort of just maps to a business process that doesn't move very much. But everything is very dynamic and changing, right? New features come out, not only in the software, but in the way the business operates. And, you know, what I like about this, other than it being representative, is it shows another thing that's very representative of companies, and that is this, uh, this, this kind of willingness and desire to beat the Silicon Valley mindset, right? So, you know, Mr. Diamond here phases it very well, but he basically is saying in the second part, like, you know, and we're going to beat them. We're not going to let them come in and take over our businesses. We're going to work as, hardly as, pos as hard as possible to essentially compete and do things the same way, the same way as they're doing and learn from them and even do it better. And we see this in, in several of, of uh, our, our companies. You know, I'll, I'll get to some logo slide of companies we talk with frequently, but there's a couple of large insurance companies like Allstate and Humana who work with Pivotal. And they have this similar mindset of like, we are going to evolve our, our industry and our business before some outsider, some Silicon Valley barbarian comes in and does it. And they're on the hunt for change and they're searching for new ways of doing things because they know that business needs to change. So the motivator, you know, you see these, these idea, this, all these companies of software defined businesses, you know, across industries. And again, when you look at this, I want you to think that these are not so much technology companies, right? They're not making software or hardware or doing the system integration around it. They're operating in very non-technology oriented, for the most part, uh, um, industries, right? Like financial services, it's always used IT very much, but it, it wasn't, you know, like a tech company, right? So you have Square moving from knuckle draggers to, to, uh, to swiping on little doodads on your iPhone. And you have Netflix, which, you know, it's, it's sort of like the Hollywood entertainment mentality, doing, having a very software-defined way of doing things. I've, I've already mentioned Uber, which should be a very easy example of what's, what's less technology-oriented and, and more boring than taxis and car services, right? But in each of these examples, and Airbnb is a great one as well, these companies have used uh, teams of software developers and the operations people who support them to dramatically change their business to the business models that they use and change how business operates and it's all because of IT and taking on this cloud mindset of of using IT now the other motivation not only is there the potential to use cloud based IT to do this right so the technology is creating opportunity for you but if you look at the overall uh, historic trajectory over over um I guess the past, uh, let me do the math in my head here, almost 50 years or so, there's a, a great study that was done that shows how difficult it is to maintain um, your position in the business world, right? And the way this study, you can look up the study at the bottom there, but what it goes over is that if you look at the company, the average lifespan of companies on, on the S&P 500, um, they, it used to be something like, I, if I remember a good 30 or 40 years that you can remain on top, but now it's, it's projected in a few years to just be maybe 10 or 15 years. So it's really hard to stay on top. The business world itself is difficult. It's difficult to maintain uh, the, your, your pole position, if you will, in there, your lead position. So regardless of technology that you're using, as a business, you're always looking for a way to grow and stay on top because it's simply, it's sort of proven to be hard to do so. And you can see companies who have exited the S&P 500, you know, big name companies that they might have disappeared entirely like, like Circuit City, or they may have just churned out or been acquired by other, other companies. And you can see new companies that have come in there. Now, there's a lot of technology companies in there, but there's also non-technology companies, right? Like Whole Foods or Family Dollar, like all, all these companies that are not necessarily tech companies. And so you have this motivation that it's already difficult to survive in a business world, and you just know that, that, that churning is occurring. So you're looking for new things to do. You want to change, you want to give yourself a, a more dynamic business model to, to use, and you also want to uh, have, have help from anywhere you can, like IT, right? And this is, you know, just further evidence, maybe a slide I should take out for the rehearsal audience, but further evidence that this is, you know, the, the numbers behind the studies, right? Now, not only is it hard to stay on top, but there's a, this great study about stall points that shows companies who like rest on their laurels and don't figure out new ways of reinventing their business, they sort of top out with their revenue growth. So ultimately, as a business, you want to get to this point where you're coming up with a sustainable way of doing innovation, coming up with new things, because your revenue is going to stall out on existing business models unless you come out with new ones and you want to establish growth. Yeah, I'll just take this, this slide out. So thinking about the idea that... Um, that businesses are looking for new ways to stay competitive, to stay on top, and to compete, right? 
when, when you look at how they reach for the bucket of IT, it's, they, they're not always, business people are not always reaching out to ID to help change them. And, and in fact, sometimes you have to prod them. And this is one of those times uh, where it's good to start putting the fear, if you will, into business and telling them what IT can do for them because they're not always aware of what's possible from the IT department. It's not like, you know, we've done a great job over, over the past few decades demonstrating that we're uh, competent and can deliver things on time. But one theory that I've been working on recently, you know, one way of gating if you should change is that unless people from the business side are freaking out about something, you'll find that it's very difficult to go through big technology change like cloud. Like you won't have all of the support and, and the tops down um, uh, support that you need with that. So whether they generally are doing it on their own or whether you go talk with them and you make them realize something new that technology can do uh, to address their freaking out, you need them on your side and it's something you have to start working with eventually unless you're going to sort of brave through the total bottoms up way of doing things. And don't get me wrong, if you have a new technology and you and the IT department are deciding to apply it on your own, taking a bottoms up approach, that's certainly possible, and you certainly be able, will be able to optimize how IT runs, right? So if you have a bad way of doing something in IT, you know, you're doing things in a ticket-based approach and you want to move to a continuous delivery approach, you certainly will get some efficiencies, right? You'll drive down costs, but unless you engage with the business, it's going to be hard for you to change the way that the business operates so that they can take advantage of, of the new capability of continuous delivery, of putting weekly deploys out. So to get the full effect, the full benefits of big change in IT, you need to engage with the business. Hence, the, the theory that unless they're freaking out, things are going to be a little more difficult for you and you may not even get the full value of doing things. So let's, let's leave that framing. I told you it would be brief, especially once I take that, uh, that rogue slide out of there. One of my favorites, but we'll get rid of it. Uh, is Essentially, the business world is desperate nowadays for innovation. They want to figure out new ways of running their business to not only retain and grow existing customers, but gain new customers and fend off competition. You know, we saw the slides of the, of the six industry categories with companies in there who were disrupting, right? Who are coming in there and essentially stealing away business from incumbents. And businesses want to know increasingly how they can use IT to be competitive, to become software-defined businesses. And the goal of a software-defined business, as we'll get into, is really to very rapidly iterate over how your software is used to run your business. And that means having a completely different mindset of software than we're used to, right? We're used to this sort of uh, waterfall-driven way of doing it where things come out. Uh, we, we study things and they come out on a year, yearly, yearly, if not sort of uh, every two years basis. But instead, we're going to tamp down everything so that we can deploy on, I always like to say weekly, but it might be monthly, it might be daily, but a much shorter period. Now, doing that with pre-cloud technology was sort of possible, but it was definitely not easy. And it wasn't something that, that, that IT helped with, let alone processes around it. So narrowing down to this desire to instill continuous integration, that's a lot of where I see cloud being helpful and why you should be thinking about and doing cloud. That's the reason to do cloud, not necessarily for driving down costs, not because it's like the right thing to do by a magazine, but because it's going to enable your business. It's one of the core tools that's going to enable your business to be a software-defined business, to start using software as, as the core way of instrumenting and running your process. So to start with, to make that point, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a small little analogy of, of what cloud isn't. And, and it sort of illustrates why I think it's important to have a very direct connection to the business and what people are doing on a daily basis with a technology like cloud. So I, w I was over in uh, Columbus earlier this year, and, and they had this lovely setup that's sort of like the, a good metaphor for go only going halfway with cloud. So here you see some great old-fashioned urinals. And for the, the, the ladies in the audience, urinals are this fascinating technology we have in the men's room. You know, we've got two different types of toilets. Sometimes you have a bidet in a ladies' room, so you've got multiple technologies. But really, in men's room, two types of technologies for uh, your toilet stuff. And what's interesting about these ones is you'll see there's a huge, I don't know, maybe like a gallon of water in there. And someone came in. These are very old uh, urinals, probably several decades old. They use a lot of water. They keep the smell away. You know, they keep flushing things like that. Everything's taken care of. But they consume a tremendous amount of water, right? So you come in and you put some sensors on there and you think like, well, instead of having this annoying behavior where men often do this for some reason, they'll sit there and like flush the toilet over and over again. It's a little insane, right? But 
let's put a sensor in there so we have better control over uh, water usage, right? We can time that it only flushes every now and then, or we can flush it each time someone's up there, but we have more control of the flushing. But then if you look at the bottom, I mean, essentially they've left the same toilet here. So they're not really solving the whole problem. They're optimizing locally instead of taking a systematic view of things. And you still end up using a huge amount of water when you could have replaced these bowls at the bottom and dramatically cut back the water consumption that you had, right? So it's kind of this like uh, like half-baked like approach to solving a problem. And, you know, you can see I, I went over this with someone... Uh, one of the, the pivotal uh, field engineers we had, whose dad actually wrote the book on plumbing, uh, oddly enough. And, you know, he verified this, this g the general theory behind here. Now, I'm reading a lot into that, that, uh, that, that sort of uh, bathroom up there in Columbus, but I think this not focusing on the entire system and only going halfway is why we see data like this, which is kind of some anecdotal data um, from a, a Gartner conference or much earlier this year. And it also, you know, this, this sad pie chart here is representative of what I would see as an analyst and see all the time when it comes to cloud projects. And that is over the past, let's say, five years, right, um, I've encountered numerous people who have had cloud projects, who have gone cloud, and it hasn't really worked out for them. Like, they haven't really achieved the full potential of what they, they thought they would have in their business cases. It just didn't feel like enough. And you see that in the question, right, where uh, Tom Bittman asked people, you know, what's going wrong with your private cloud installation? And uh, there's this 5% that everything's working stupendously. It's great. But all, but all the other 95% of, of them, something has gone wrong with their private cloud project. And when I look at it, a lot of them are sort of not really technology problems, uh, but they're, they're failures at a process or a person level, right? So they didn't change their operational model enough. They, they did too little. They didn't change the funding model or they focused on the wrong benefits. So they, just like the people who put those sensors in for the urinals, right? They weren't focusing on the right things and they didn't change enough to get full benefit. So, you know, they might have just swapped out one technology for another and they didn't really get much benefit. Or worse, they're left with two different technologies, their pre-cloud and their cloud technology, and there's not this maximal benefit they're getting from it. So, you know, I look at this and what I start to think is you've got to focus on the right things when you're doing cloud. You have to know what it's good for and really latch onto that and focus on that instead of, of, of thinking about it's just sort of a replacement for server management or things like that. It's not raw infrastructure. And as I've mentioned several times, I think of cloud as one of the key enablers for, for becoming a software-defined business, right, which, which I've hammered on quite a bit. So to that end, you know, if you don't have a full notion of what a software-defined business is, this is a, a quote from uh, my, my friend and boss, Andrew. And it basically, you know, if you're not building a software business as a company, you're probably losing to someone who is. And that's, that's a good way of boiling down what these software-defined businesses are, right? So as a company, you start thinking of the, what you're building is not only a business, but a software business, right? And that's a huge amount of what cloud can help with to help you escape from those uh, urinals that just are, have a sensor on top, but are there, that, are, that are wasting water to really focus on the, uh, the full benefits of what you have. So to do that, if you want to go down this path of using cloud to become a software-defined business, it's, it's good to start thinking about uh, strategically about it and planning it out. So the end goal is that you want to set up continuous delivery as a process. Uh, and that's, that's a highly tooled process of how you get your software out the door. And you look at DevOps as, as sort of the culture and the human process, the meatware, that allows you to focus on better software design the development and increasing the throughput of your custom written software, right? So you're really going to look at the development of your software as your core factory, right? So once you start thinking about it as a core process, you really spend a lot of time perfecting it. And how you do that is going to be defined by, because you're running on cloud infrastructure, you're going to follow cloud native architecture and coding patterns, which we'll get into briefly, which are, which are sufficiently different from non-cloud or pre-cloud architectures, you know, three-tier things and even some LAMP stack ways of doing things. There's, by nature of running on cloud and being scalable and deploying every week, it changes, it leaks back to the way that you do your architecting and coding. And then finally, there's enablement that's used. So not only the raw infrastructure as a service, the, the virtualized and cloud infrastructure underneath, but there, there's a bevy of services that, that are collected together that are used not only for developers and also the middleware that runs it, but especially in operations where you start to have different concerns when you're operating as a software-defined business. And again, you can build all these things on your own. You can make your own cloud, cloud platform. 
But as we see amongst many of our customers who actually started out building their own cloud, cloud platform, they like to focus on the application more and not building a platform. When they're becoming uh, when they're becoming a business that's building software, they want to build the applications that run their business, not the cl the, the cloud platforms that run their business. So it just depends what uh, what your predilections are and uh, what 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 you want to do. But you're definitely going to need a cloud platform to help out with all of this. So let's look at continuous delivery and DevOps uh, briefly. And as with all of this, uh, you know, in in a, in a short presentation like this, none of it is going to give you the full view of what you need to do. But I just want to sort of give you some terms and pointers to other things that you can start uh, learning from and, and and start thinking about this. And more importantly, understand why it's important to do these things. So as you're looking at becoming a software-defined business, keep in mind on all sides of the house, the business and the IT, all of the roles. This this slide, what's what's represented in this slide, is the goal. You want to establish continuous delivery. I, I should say it's the goal from an IT's perspective. The goal of the business is to make money. You know, the overall goal of this combined together is to create things that your customers find valuable and especially more valuable than their customers and they want to give you money for. But you know, let's come down to the IT department and the goal is to establish a continuous delivery pipeline. Now, the idea of continuous delivery has actually been around for quite some time. All you know, throughout most of the two thousands, where we started off with continuous integration, which is you know, having your test run. When you check in a new piece of, of code, your continuous integration builds everything and runs the test and makes sure the build works, right? And continuous delivery adds on a few other notions. And one of them is that we're going to be able to deliver it into production in the, almost as easily as, as we can uh, sort of do the continuous integration build. And in order to do that, you obviously need a high degree of automation and, and similarity between the development, QA, and staging and production environments. And you can start to imagine that if I'm using cloud, right, it starts to make it easier to make those environments the same because I'm using the same type of, of cloud in both, right? There's not a difference between the infrastructure and the data centers that I use in production and in development. Because I'm using a cloud technology that has great APIs, you know, whether it's Amazon or a private cloud or whatever, I have the same usage on each. I don't have to translate between different things in production, right? And if I get a highly programmable cloud, right, my, my programmable infrastructure, in development, I can start to program how load balancers are configured, and I can start to program how databases are connected together and how scaling happens. All of this stuff starts to become programmable. And it sort of compresses together those concerns into a smaller team because we've automated so much of it instead of it being manual. So part of what continuous delivery contemplates is the idea that production now becomes programmable and it smooths out the effort that it takes to move builds along there, right? Like it should be very seamless and highly automated to do that. Now, in addition to having things like continuous integration, being able to deploy to production more, uh, there's also a great benefit that you have when something is in production, and as long as it's up and running and collecting well, right, you have all your production concerns of monitoring and, and keeping it up and running, as we'll get into, you establish this feedback loop. So if I'm deploying on a very short time interval, uh, a weekly or a daily interval, I can start to get insight into how people are using the code a lot more frequently than if I'm deploying every 12 or 18 months, right? And not only do I get insight, not only do I, can I read, if you will, what people are doing and study them, but I can make changes, so I can write things back to the system. Now, this means that I, I have a weak window, at least, where I can deploy a patch if I can figure out how to fix something, right? So my ability to fix something becomes faster. But it also means that if I release a feature and people aren't using it very much, I can try to hone that. I can, in weak intervals, I can, I can perfect this feature that I've released into production and, and make it so that people uh, might use it more, right? So I, in fact, can create, I can have more errors because I have more opportunities to create those errors. And if you, if you start thinking about it from a, um, an enterprise architecture and management standpoint, this reduces risk, right? So this is kind of illustrated above, but because I have so many chances to deploy to production to hone and fix things, the risk that I'll end up with something that users don't want or that doesn't work well towards my intentions is reduced because I have a lot of opportunity to fix it rather than just like this one window every, every 12, mo uh, 12 months. So all of this continuous delivery stuff, these abilities that continuous delivery gives you is valuable for businesses that are seeking to change how they're doing, to evolve their business practices and compete and be software defined businesses. Now, getting to that point is difficult, right? Like you, you not only have your continuous integration, but think about all the people involved in getting a release out the door and how you have to change them over to this new mindset. Think about the tooling that you use, right? I mentioned having, um, essentially the same uh, infrastructure, cloud infrastructure through everything. There's all sorts of things that are happening. Plus, 
from an operation standpoint, we're deploying code almost at will every week or every day, and that probably puts lots of operations people like uh, in in a very uh, negative and foul mood. <laughs> so, a lot of a lot of the difficulties of getting continuous delivery up and running of what you know, have, has resulted in DevOps. So. DevOps is another thing, and there's some great references at the bottom to, to look up if you want to uh, dig further into that. I really recommend uh, Chapter 8 of the, the Practice of Cloud System Administration as, as a good thing to read there. But these, go there's, these, these are some goals that lead to, the, to, to DevOps. That is, looking at you know, the pipeline as your factory, as I was just going over, delivering software on the internet so you have to operate at scale and you're, you have highly networked distributed applications, and also just the, the sheer thing of having faster turns on your application, right? So if you're deploying new code to production, you need to, every week, you need to ensure that it, that it works and that it's following good hygiene, that it has good performance and uptime, right? Like, there's a lot of, of things that go into making sure that your applications uh, can run in, in a cloud environment. And those learnings have to be brought all the way back to development and you have to make sure developers are following those practices. And as a consequence, if, if you go read up on these more, you'll see that the, the practices and the craft of DevOps has really sprung up around these goals. And as the name would imply, what it means is, as you could kind of imagine when I was going over continuous integration earlier, is the roles and the functions of developers and operations start to coalesce onto one team, right? In the same way back in agile software development that it turned out it was actually nicer to have the testers on the developer team, right? A lot of people forget this, but agile kind of took over QA. It was just more efficient to have them on one team. When you're operating in, in, a, in a cloud way, uh, it's more efficient to have the developers and the operators working more hand in hand. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that, that you have all these full stack developers who know everything running around, but you more have a team that has all these capabilities and they're all working on that whole life cycle of the individual, the, the product. They don't have these silos that they're operating in that not only slow things down, but introduce lower quality into the system. So DevOps has been evolving for quite some time. I think at, at least uh, five years, uh, you know, kind of more back to 2007 and, and, and the 2008 period. But you can see that it's actually a quite a uh, complicated process in a good way. Sophisticated would be a better word, right? And this is just one way of, of defining and putting your arms around all of what DevOps is and what the handoffs are from uh, Cameron over at Gartner. I think I think it's a it's a nice chart. Now, there's a few other things I would point out. If you read uh, Gene Kim's The Phoenix Project, there's kind of the three ways of DevOps that kind of go over uh, sort of a tops down philosophical approach to what DevOps is. And John Willis and Damon Edwards came up with uh, CAMS. Uh, which is another good approach for it. But there's all sorts of definitions of DevOps. But it's it's good, again, to know why you're doing it. And as you start to read more and more about DevOps, you'll see why there's this motivation to mash these two, these two roles together and start having the operations and the developer people more knowledgeable and about what each other is doing and helping each other out as, uh, as companies seek to get continuous delivery in place. So now, that's the first thing that's, that's important to start thinking about. If, if you... Our, you, your organization is seeking to become a software-defined business, and you don't have something like continuous delivery in place, which has led you to contemplate and think about DevOps, you definitely, that's your first step. Let's get some continuous integration, then continuous delivery in place, and start to understand what DevOps is and everything that's needed for that. And our goal is that we're going to start releasing on weekly, we release our software on weekly basis, and let's, let's see how that affects things and what that drives. One of the things you'll, you'll start to find is that it drives the need to have cloud-native applications. Now, because of the nature of how cloud runs, it, it, it likes to run uh, in a very horizontal scale way, and it encourages a lot of stateless thinking, right? So if all of the parts of your application, if you decompose your application down into different parts, uh, and the more you rely on things like state and the more you embed configuration in there There's just all these practices that we have from the three tier days. that don't really work very well uh, on cloud infrastructure You just have to change the way you do your coding and this isn't sort of like a wholly unexpected thing as you change your infrastructure out Right the way the way you program in client server is much different than the way you program a web application is much different than the way that when you go back to client server and do mobile applications, the way you program there. And all of this is much different than the way that you'll program a mainframe based batch job system where you're kind of chaining together a bunch of, uh, you know, have some ETL and processes that are running. The infrastructure drives the way you architect your application. And we're always trying to escape that and we kind of minimize it uh, as much as possible. But it's good to get familiar with the, the idea of a 12 factor application, which the first few times you'll read it, it'll seem a little obtuse and weird, but as you start to practice and do these things, you'll understand what it means to separate out your configuration, right? 
uh, and to really declare your dependencies and to focus on the ephemeral nature of, of the parts of, of the applications that you're building. Now, what this means is that, as always, the data layer becomes very difficult and managing the services that you have is hard and it's, a, it's basically you're developing a distributed application, right, which is a, is a tricky way of going about things. But the good news is you're not doing this all on your own. There are many different frameworks and platforms and libraries that help you out with these new types of distributed application. But it's just good to be mindful of, of what these things are. So start off by kind of going over and learning what 12-factor apps are. You can get one of the, uh, we have a couple of simple examples that we use um, with Pivotal. You can use the Spring Music Store, and you can start to look through it and see what, it, what it's like to develop in, in a, uh, a cloud-native way. But there are things that become different uh, when you're doing that because it's a different style of, of uh, doing development. So another large thing to point you to is this idea of microservices, which you've probably come across. And, you know, you can look at microservices in all sorts of ways. The, the cynical uh, among us can look at it as just another attempt at service-oriented architectures, right? Where we're going to break things out and we're going to interact with various services that we have over the network. You know, you could take another look that's like, ah, I remember my canonical object-oriented programming and where you had these objects that were passing messages to each other. And, and, and that's, that's just an evolution of that. But, you know, that's all fair. What's, what's different about microservices is that it takes much of a, an operational mentality into account. And it, realize, it, it kind of forces a lot of things like doing most everything over HTTP, although there's some simple queuing things that you can use. But what it likes to do is figure out what you might call a bounded context, right? So what, is, what are all the data and the models that are needed for one discrete service? And that service might be looking up uh, recommended books, or it might be logging someone in, or it might be um, in the industrial space something like getting an inventory of all the light bulbs or something like that. But you figure out this very uh, bounded context of something, and you write one discrete service that handles just that. Right? You don't have, a, in contrast, a monolithic single database thing that takes care of everything, but you're breaking things up into little pieces that can be composed together, kind of like a mashup, if you remember that, or composable architectures. And when you're going about doing microservices, right, like it, it only starts mattering when you have a mid-sized to large application, because there is a lot of upfront effort that goes into decomposing things like this. But again, when you do this decomposition, it makes it run better on cloud arc infrastructures. And it also gets you procedural things, that if you decouple the, the roadmap of all of these different services, there's less dependencies and you can start to move faster. Maybe not all of your services get updated at the same time, but there's a certain rhythm that you get into where you don't need them updated at the same time. You just start to compose them. And again, the focus is on delivering things at scale, but also delivering things at a higher frequency. So this way of architecting tries to decouple things to achieve both cloud scale and also a speed of, of doing delivery. And again, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated to get into at first. In fact, their recommendation is to start with the opposite of this, a monolith at small, and then break it apart into different services. But you should start familiarizing yourself with what a microservices approach is, and more importantly, what the technologies are that support it and what it looks like, and also the benefits that you should be achieving when, when looking at it. So as further reading on this topic, uh, there's this great book that one of the, uh, the, the, the guys at Pivotal wrote, Matt Stein, about migrating to cloud native applications. Now it goes over using Spring Cloud and a little bit of Cloud Foundry, but it really starts off going over some of these concerns, what microservices are and 12-factor applications, and how you can start chunking up your existing applications and moving them to this new way of doing it, re refactor them as needed. And also at a much lower level in the footnotes, you can see there's actually a great uh, blog post recently about how to, how to get down to the code level and start to migrate your legacy code over to, to a new way of doing things. So again, pointers, further reading for you to go uh, explore these exciting topics. So finally, let's go over what cloud platforms have to offer. So as I mentioned several times, as you're thinking through getting a continuous delivery system into place and deploying on a weekly basis, your mind should be thinking, holy crap, that's a lot of supporting services I'm going to need. Right? Like this is a lot different than just delivering, shipping a DVD and a piece of cardboard to someone and, and you know, having a plane full of system integrator people come and help them set it up. Right? Much, most everything is automated. And then you had the first day where you install the application, but then you're going to have a lot of day two concerns. We need to keep this thing up and running. As, as services fail and they need to be brought back up, we need to uh, diagnose problems and fix them, deploying patches or 
we need to scale it up or scale it down. There's all sorts of operational concerns that come with this new way of, of, of architecting and running your applications. And you'll quickly find that you'll come up with, with a, a set of services that, that you use all throughout the continuous delivery pipeline. And they start to become your tool chain, if you will. Now, you also will need a place to run this, right? You need the actual runtime. And what ourselves at Pivotal and, and people in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem and other people who are working on cloud, cloud platforms are doing is they're trying to come up with that tool chain that's not only used by development operations, but is also the runtime. It's kind of the totality of everything that you need across the life cycle of your application. And, and this notion, all that stuff you need to develop in a continuous delivery way and also run in production and, and, and do all the usual things you need in operations is, is a lot of how I think about what cloud platforms are. Now, uh, a lot of that was formally tied up in this notion of a PaaS, a platform as a service, but we, you know, I try to shy away from this term except as, a, as an analogous pointer because platform as a service was really, as, as a thing, has been focused a lot on the developer concerns and hasn't brought in a lot of the operational concerns, which start to become much, much of the hard part. So, you know, you can call this PaaS if you want, but I think cloud platforms is a, is a much better way of thinking about it because it indicates the, uh, the totality of it, the, the, the whole system level thing. You're not just focusing on a sensor to the, to the detriment of uh, trying to conserve water. So let's start from the bottom, right? Over the past 10 years, uh, or more actually, like uh, there's been a, a huge improvement at the infrastructure layer, right? So oddly enough, I stopped programming at the beginning of this cycle, so I remember the old way uh, very astutely, like it was yesterday. Everyone remembers when they stopped coding. Uh, I, I sometimes too much, but... You know, infrastructure was not very agile and malleable, right? It would take a long time just to get a developer lab set up, let alone once the developers had created the golden image to set up your production environment, deploy it to production, monitor it, like all this stuff was, was very time intensive. And it's almost as if um, no one really realized that that was, that was uh, terrible. It was just the way it was, right? It takes a long time to build a house and it takes a long time to uh, remodel a house. And until someone comes up with a much faster way of doing it, you don't realize that there's a better way. But there's been an evolution that started, I think, in automation and configuration management and was driven by the pressures that companies like Google and Netflix and Amazon and Facebook had to scale up. And so with all this automation and this need to scale up, over the years, it's really driven great innovations in speeding up infrastructure and making infrastructure more agile. And in fact, one of the early precursor names for DevOps was Agile Infrastructure, which was trying to capture, hey, everyone, you can get way beyond like service desks and tickets and really automate everything and get to this programmable infrastructure state. And so we had better ways of running infrastructure, and we got to an even better state um, when when the mobile re, you know re revolution if you will came and and you know Apple uh, the iPhone launched in two thousand seven and then we had Android and now a tremendous amount of software is run um, on not either on mobile phones as web applications or native applications so a completely different user interface paradigm came on that added yet another force that that caused a lot of need for not only IT to change but lots of uh, opportunities for business to change so luckily you got this confluence of events. Uh, uh, infrastructure becoming e more easy to automate with virtualization, with your configuration management stuff, with your automation, with containers, all sorts of things. And then there was another uh, exogenous or external pressure that came in to just rewrite things as mobile and started to pressure businesses to become software-defined businesses, right? So the technology has improved greatly and it's been, it's been pushed on by these external forces. So this has caused a lot of what I've been talking about. And when you look at the technology that's emerged to support all of, of, of this new way of doing applications, it introduces a lot of what we think of as uh, day two problems, right? So you've got developers who can develop things on a daily basis, right? They have a build that's ready to go into production. Uh, you're operating at scale. So you could scale up at any instance, in any instant over the, the public internet and need to support a lot more users. You might need to scale down to save money, right? So you, you're, you're, you're whip flashing around potentially. I'm, I'm doing kind of the hyperbolic treatment of, of things uh, just for effect. Or, and, and then also, you have these new types of devices, mobile devices to support with the frameworks that they have. You have services that you might be interacting with, right? You might need to log into Facebook. You might want to use um, Stripe or Square for, for your, um, your payment processing. So you've got all this bevy of new stuff to deal with. And when you finally deploy after the first day, you deploy your cloud application into production. 
you then, you know, you, you hopefully go to sleep. Maybe you don't get too drunk because something might happen during your celebration time. Uh, but you have your day two problems, right? So there's a lot of these things that are normal issues. I'm not going to read through all of them for, for IT, right? Like you need, you need to have some role-based access to resources, right? You, you want to define what types of roles, what, what people can access what type of thing. You're going to need to be able to deploy code into production on, on a weekly, if not shorter, basis, right? So you need to, that takes a lot of control of doing that. When, when failures occur, you still need to be able to isolate those failures quickly and recover for them. You might even need to do things in order to achieve resilience, like if you deploy uh, a new type of code to production and it doesn't work, you might want to roll back with, within minutes, you know, maybe an hour or so, to the previous version of something so that you don't bring down all of production. Now, again, doing all of that stuff is, is not easy. There are ways of doing it, and it takes not only technology to do it, but a lot of discipline, and to a certain extent, compromise, right? Like, if you just let the developers do anything, you're not going to achieve a lot of these 12 factor, uh, twelve operational factors that, that you need to. So what, what I've been seeing over the years, and especially now that I'm at Pivotal, is I see people codifying into their runtime, into the platform, the ability to do all these operational things. So not only do they put in the traditional platform as a service features, like having a self-service catalog that, that developers can go to and uh, look up features. You know, a developer can go to a properly functioning platform as a service and get themselves a database without having to talk with anyone, create tables in there. They can do everything on their own, right? Just imagine going to an AWS cloud and a and developer can get whatever they want. If they know how to configure it, they can get it. They don't have to file a ticket for it. So you have all of those features built in there, but you also have a lot of the features that you see at the bottom, right? So you need to build in monitoring and management into the platform, right? You don't want that to be something that you have to do on your own or only rely on third parties to do. You want third parties to enhance it. There's a tremendous amount of logging that you need to build into the system, right? This is logging is something relied on uh, a lot. So something like logging, when you look at a cloud platform and especially Pivotal Cloud Foundry, is a, a first order concern. It's built into there that, that people can use it. Now there's a you know, and then of course you want to run it on whatever infrastructure you want. Whether you want to run it in the private cloud, you want to build your own cloud and run it in the private cloud, whether it's VMware, OpenStack, or AWS what infrastructure you run on shouldn't really be that big of a deal. So all of these concerns are, are what I see more and more wrapped up into the notion of a, of a cloud platform. If I was still an industry analyst, this would be a category that I would try to uh, pioneer and create and, and, and model out. Um, so anyways, uh, just, just as, a, as, as a small pitch, you know, to add credence to this being a thing, um, so we've been working on Cloud Foundry for about six years now, I think, just trying to learn from all those companies like Google and Facebook and build the kind of platform they rely on on their system to bring it to the enterprise. And we've been basically a year in GA, and the reception of this has been so great that we've validated the need for this. You can see, you can judge that by revenue that we've gotten in bookings, by the number of customers that we have. And these are not, um, you know, startup companies or little weird tech shops wearing, you know, smelly hoodies and things like this. These are normal enterprises. People like Kroger or Allstate, Humana, I've mentioned, Lockheed. These are companies who saw the need to become better at being software-defined businesses, transformed how they're doing things on a weekly business, you know, so that they can do their software on a weekly basis. And you can see a lot of them, uh, if you get their presentation, you can click on these videos and you can see the, the keynotes that they go over. And they don't really talk about Pivotal Cloud Foundry very much. They talk about how they've changed their organization and the benefits that they've gotten. And it's not easy, but the end result, you know, just to use one example, Humana, you know, they, they, on the third, their third project where they were doing this, and they'd had some good success in the first two projects, they had targeted getting an Apple Watch uh, application out there, and they got it out in five weeks, right? I mean, just if, if, if you're in a large enterprise, think about the idea of getting an application into users' hands that works in, in a five-week time period, right? So they were able to launch their application, which would remind people to like stand up and drink more, right? So it directly affects their business as a health insurance company. They're promoting healthier activities uh, amongst um, their users, right? Which should generate them more profit. And within five weeks, they could deploy it because they were putting into practice a lot of the things that I've been talking about in this presentation to become a software-defined business. And to that end, with just a small little case at the end, there's plenty more you can dive into. Uh, thanks for listening in. And uh, if you want to talk about more of these things or uh, you want to check out the slides, you know, here's some links. And I'm always happy to discuss. And now we should have a, uh, I, I think, about uh, a, a, around 10 minutes or so for, for questions. And 
for those in the, the rehearsal audience here, you know, I would say the same things. There, there, there are little things that are rough in there. Thanks for helping me to discover a slide to take out. That's always nice. And uh, I, I'd be, I'd be uh, thrilled to hear your, your feedback on this stuff uh, and uh, what, uh, what you're seeing. You know, whether, whether you're a buyer, a vendor, or whoever, it's always good to get uh, questions and feedback to, to hone the core message there. And uh, so with that, we'll see everyone next time.